Hello to everyone who's either watching us live or watching us after this session is recorded. My name is Isabel Parasram and I'm here in my capacity as a trustee of the Paddy Ashdown Forum, which is a think tank. And we discuss issues of the day and certainly we've got a series of events that we've got planned and this is one of them on ageism. I'm also here in my capacity as Vice President of the Liberal Democrats. And today we're, we've got some brilliant guest speakers who will introduce themselves in just a moment. But I just wanted to thank you for being here, to thank our speakers for taking the time out to be here during what is a very busy time for them. You'll hear what it is that they do and understand why it's such a busy time. I just wanted to alert everyone to the fact that this session is being recorded and will be put onto YouTube and other channels at some point. So if you are participating and you don't want to be identified, um, if you're on screen, turn off your camera or you can change your name if you would also like to do that. And that can be done via the buttons that are on the bottom of your screen. And please excuse me as I go through this session. Sometimes I'll be looking down because I'm checking notes or looking at some of the questions that have come in. So that's where we're at with the technicalities. Um, this subject is one that's arisen really from the experience of some of my colleagues within the Paddy Ashdown Forum of things that they've heard that have happened to older people within society and people discriminating against them in what I call micro ways. So, you know, we were just discussing this morning about people crossing the road when they see elderly people or actually being openly abused. And a lot of this has stemmed from misconceptions. I think all discrimination and inequality stems from misconceptions. I know that in my work as head of a barrister's chambers, I'm continually fighting against breaches of uh, discrimination in my work and equality matters. And often these stem from people really simply being ignorant of other people and the way that they relate or their background or their culture. And so this is just an opportunity to be able to explore that. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from both of our speakers. We'll hear first from Gordon Lishman, who was a former, uh, were you the chief executive of Age Concern? Or yes. the general, right, chief executive of Age Concern. And so you've got so much that you can share with us on your experiences, Gordon. And we also have Deborah Green, uh, who is the CEO of Rock UK, which is redeeming our communities. And it's a brilliant organization that affects change across every sector of society, as far as I can tell. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from them. So the way that we're going to run this session today is that we're going to hear from each speaker. And then at roughly half past 12 British summer time, we will take questions. So if you would like to ask a question, I'd really love it if you could ask your question live. You don't have to be seen on video, you can just do it by audio. But please do pop your question into the chat and then I can decide whether it fits with what we're discussing and indicate as you write it whether you'd like to ask live so um, and indicate whether you'd like to be on video. But otherwise I can speak it out for you. So I think we should start now with Gordon, just introducing yourself and giving us a bit of your background and then you can tell us um, what you have to say on the subject matter. Thank you, Isabel, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event. Um, I, of course, my main qualification is that we're now talking about me. I am one of these um, people sequestered at home and dependent on children to do my shopping for uh, the course of the last three months. Um, however, it, I, I was working it out, it's 49 years since I first published a book on the subject of um, ageism and older people. Um, it's about 55 years since I was first involved in European liberal politics, and it's nearer 60 years since I was first involved in UK liberal politics, so this event brings those three things together uh, quite well. I, I, I can't resist a word as well about Paddy. Um, Paddy never worked in an organization concerned with aging and older people. And if you asked him, he would have told you that he had never quite forgiven me and my then boss, uh, Sally Greengross, for refusing to employ him 
at a time when we thought his energies were uh, probably better spent in, uh, in Yeovil. Um, it's also fair to say this is a personal response to ageing. Um, uh, Paddy was not good at it and was wholly opposed to the idea of getting older and chose to resist it as long as, uh, as, long as possible. I want to address three things. One, the underlying question about ageism and discrimination. Secondly, a few thoughts about what's happening to people here and worldwide. And thirdly, just a few thoughts about what happens next. It's a very liberal topic because it raises issues about liberty, equality and community. And the point about liberty is very much the point about discrimination and prejudice. Nowhere illustrates this better than language. Suddenly, after decades of campaigning to talk about older people, just like disabled people have fought to be called people, and indeed so have other marginalized groups, suddenly when we get this crisis, people are talking about the elderly, and even horrifyingly, Boris talks about our elderly as if I belonged to him. I don't belong to anybody else, and certainly not to Boris Johnson. What that language does is deny agency. It actually denies our right and our capability to speak for ourselves. We are people and have the rights of people, regardless of our age. That's why, going back um, some years now, to when we established the steering committee for what has now become the Commission on Equalities and New Human Rights. I argued that it should be founded in a concept of human rights rather than an overemphasis on the individual strands. And uh, that remains the case until the disability lobby got its act together towards the end of that process. And then finally, Trevor Phillips took over as chair of uh, the new organization at which point it degenerated into an organization of strands rather than one that talked about the human rights of people as people and that's particularly important in areas of what uh, nowadays are talked about as intersectionality but in those days we often talked about triple jeopardy or quadruple jeopardy from people who fell into different categories and had the cumulative effect of discrimination and prejudice arising from those. If we look at what's been happening now around the world, it is obvious that there has been a level of discrimination which has killed large numbers of older people. To give a very clear cut example, now clearly demonstrated in this country, for a local authority to make its funding for a care home conditional on accepting unassessed and untested patients coming out of hospital has been deliberately to recognize that it is going to kill a significant number of people. In other areas, the failure to recognize throughout the developed world, the issues around care homes, um, particularly when it became clear that older people were disproportionately at risk, has been entirely culpable. Where I live, I would not have been admitted to hospital for any reason in the early months of lockdown because of my age. This was not because of any assessment of my clinical condition, nor was it because the, all the beds were taken up by younger people suffering from COVID-19. It was not a clinical decision. It was a deliberate choice by policymakers, the effect of which has been substantially to increase the number of deaths. Over my career, I talked particularly about excess deaths as a tool, usually in, in this country, um, in the context of excess winter deaths and the effect of cold and hypothermia on uh, older people and other 
cause, I may say, that was very close to Paddy's heart, partly because his predecessor in Yeovil as a Liberal candidate was a very eminent doctor who was one of the first to draw attention to these issues. Excess deaths is a way of seeing what is actually happening. And that applies here. If people have died unnecessarily because they could not have access to an empty bed and unused clinical care because they were denied it purely on the grounds of their age, something which has happened throughout the United Kingdom during this crisis, then that is a deliberate denial of the most important of their human rights, which is the right to life. Let's look a bit further at saying where we're going to next. There seems to me at present to be a broad agreement that the appropriate response to where we have been is not another round of austerity. That's good. There will, however, come to be a point, and we're very near there at the moment, where decisions are going to have to be made about the effect, including longer-term economic and health effects, of some of the measures that are being taken to contain, contain COVID against the implications of the disease itself. And I would not want to underestimate the effects on health and longevity of economic depression. There's quite a lot of evidence on that issue. So we're going to have to take some difficult decisions. I would say strongly that those decisions should not deny individual human rights, nor should they be made secretly and quietly. If there is a case for openness and honesty about decisions that are being made in our societies, then it is crucial that we should all know what's happening and we should understand it. There will also be some issues about how we pay for things. I very, very much want to avoid any move towards the emphasis on generational difference and conflict which we have seen emerging from time to time. These issues are not about age, they're about money. I think, for instance, that there is a strong case for saying that those of us, including me, who actually have gone through this process with our guaranteed uh, defined benefit um, income at the same level, but with severely reduced consumption, might well be people who can make a contribution to what happens next. I also think that the ludicrous approach which we and other countries have towards inheritance is an issue that needs to be properly addressed. But going further forward, we have got in the short term to address the issues around the funding of social care. This is not because people don't know how to do it. I spent 25 years of my life working with people who were coming up with the same answers. It is actually a decision about government spending money on it and what it's going to do. I just want to finish with a quick word though about the global implications of pandemic. If we had the same mortality rate in India that that country saw during the Spanish flu, so-called, of 1919-20, we will be looking at deaths in the tens of millions. It's clear that in India and Brazil, perhaps most, infection rates and even mortality rates are being under-recorded. This is an issue for the whole world. It will be an economic issue for the whole world to address, and it will be a social issue. One of the downsides of the way that this uh, epidemic has been approached is that it has increased national exceptionalism, particularly, of course, in the United States, but here and in other places. It has increased the sense that we as a community and as a nation 
are fighting our way through this. If we do not recognize the global implications of this ep uh, epidemic and the effect that it will have on hundreds of millions of people throughout the world over the next 20, 30 years and more, then we will be creating longer term problems for ourselves as a society. Particularly, we will be doing so for those of us who believe in liberal democracy. We have got to keep our eyes open. We've got to recognize the rest of the world. We've got to look for the cooperative and joint approaches we can use to economic regeneration after the pandemic and to how we help people to meet the shorter term social consequences. Thank you very much, Gordon. That was so comprehensive in such a short space of time. <laughs> I'm so impressed. Thank you very much. It must be wonderful to sit down and have a cup of coffee with you. Um, um, I'm really glad that you brought up the issue of um, loneliness and the isolation. You might not have used quite those words, but um, I, I noted that Professor Alison Chastine of the University of Toronto uh, talked a lot about the conflict really between civil liberties and the idea that we are almost forcing older people into loneliness and social isolation, which is naturally a big problem in any event. Um, but in these circumstances, it must be awful. And I know, you know, I know the theory that older people in particular benefit so much just from being able to hug grandchildren and other children in their lives. And it is very meaningful that during such a terrible crisis when you don't know if you're going to end up being in hospital where you can't say goodbye to your loved ones, that you can't actually remember the last time that you hugged them. And it's just some important physical touch for mental health. And, um, you know, it, it's so tragic. But then we have to balance that against the safety of those people and, and you know, the, the, the actual risk of life versus death. So perhaps that's something we can explore later. But thank you very much for that, Gordon. I'll now hand over to Deborah. And I know you've probably got quite a different angle of very much pragmatic action within the community. Um, I'm a great admirer of your work, Deborah, and I'd really recommend anybody who um, has access to the internet to be able to look at some of the work of redeeming our communities because it is quite impactful across the UK. Over to you, Deborah. Thanks so much, Isabel. I'm, I'm already enlightened after hearing Gordon's very comprehensive talk. Um, and I, it's wonderful that I met you, Isabel, last year at a conference and we've got to become friends. Um, I'm not very active in the political scene, except if you look at my Facebook post at the moment, you probably would say that I am. <laughs> trying to speak out for the marginalised, trying to speak up for those who um, have no voice in various contexts. But uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Deborah Green. Um, based in Manchester, you might be able to tell by my accent, but uh, I um, oversee, I'm the CEO of a, a national charity. We thought it was gonna stay in Manchester and it's grown to become a national charity and actually an international charity. Um, over these last few years. It's 16 years old. We are called uh, ROC, R-O-C, short for Redeeming Our Communities. And we're a community engagement charity. People of goodwill working together towards safer, kinder and stronger communities. And I'm sure we all agree that we want to see safer, kinder, stronger communities. I'm the mother of four. I am the grandmother of seven. And um, I, uh, I can't pretend to, to be as learned as uh, Gordon on the subject of ageism, but have noticed as I've been getting personally older, how you see how you are overlooked in situations, how you are patronized, um, how you almost seem to lose your role in other people's eyes. And, I'm sure none of you watched the show, but I was watching The X Factor. <laughs> I'm a big fan of The X Factor. And um, I like the music and I like the fun of it and the competitiveness of it. 
and a young man was was performing and he'd been brought up by his grandmother it was a really moving story and um, he did really well with his song everybody was applauding and then the judges were asking him about his life and he explained how he was brought up by his grandmother and they asked how old his grandmother was he said 74 and everybody said ah oh. and i just i just was horrified i thought well it's lovely that you appreciate the grandmother's role in this young man's life but there was a pity at the age of 74 which is a young age my my father is mid mid 80s and i wouldn't want to say are oh, about him you know he's a, he's a significant uh, person in our society as all people are so i definitely wholeheartedly agree with gordon and i think my contribution today is around what can we do to listen learn and to address as isabel said before the issue of elderly isolation uh, age concern have done an amazing job as have age uk and many organizations age uk have reported in 2014 that around 5 million people over the age of 65 feel lonely most of the time and 3.9 million say tv is their main company now some may prefer their own company and we mustn't uh, enforce socialization on people because they like to be on their own certainly my dad is in that category he doesn't want someone arriving at his house taking him to a tea dance he would be horrified by that but nevertheless many people and 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 we know the health effects it's equivalent to um, the same harmful effects of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. There are other statistics around how loneliness can affect people. So we've been working as ROC to host community conversations across the UK. We've had 200 of them. And the key is bringing people of goodwill together from the political sphere, the public services, the police, the fire services, the health um, you know, sphere, education, uh, churches and faith-based communities to talk about how can we work together. I'm sure you'll all agree, all these folks work in their own silos. We all have our ways of talking that is, needs deciphering on many, many occasions. And we don't listen and we, don't, we duplicate efforts it, it costs a lot of money to do that and um, I, I believe in co-locating or even if we can just make sure that services are united in their efforts to reach out to communities to address needs and um, that is a really good way forward. Now um, when we do our community conversations we call rock conversations we produce a report afterwards having listened to what people have said of all ages um, and to, uh, to identify the top four or five social issues that are identified in that particular uh, geographical area and um, over the 200 that we've um, undertaken all in the UK um, at the moment although we did do a couple in Australia, but I won't cover that now. Elderly isolation and loneliness comes out in the top five at every single event that we have undertaken. And then we form an action group to address that particular social needs. So in, the, in the case of elderly isolation, what can we do? Because we can talk, but action is speaking louder than words um, so we've set up befriending schemes telephone mentoring schemes we have um, at least the opportunity to signpost people to services that they might not be aware of and if people want to be taken to be introduced to the tea dance i'll just use that as an example or the drop-in cafe or a game of golf or something that they may not have confidence to go 
by themselves. They may have lost their partner, their confidence dips often when that happens. And to be re reunited, if you like, or reintroduced to something within society, uh, but not in a patronizing way, just to accompany, just to be there as a listening friend, a befriender, as it were. And to learn a lot from that process as well. We've got intergenerational works, cafes, after school cafes for young people. And then two of our best volunteers are in their 80s, Cynthia and Jean, former teaching profession, teaching the kids nail art, talking to them about their homework, perhaps listening with the young people in a more um, meaningful way sometimes than even their parents can do, because we, we know there's sometimes friction there with teens and their parents. And Jean and Cynthia going along, listening, and they're helped by it, but the young people are equally helped by it. it there's an equality there. And it's just brought fresh life to communities. So I think my passion, really, you can hear, is listening to our community and learning from what people have said and then how do we address these social issues and it's really quite exciting when you can have antisocial behavior amongst young people as a problem uh, elderly isolation as a problem in another sphere and bring the two together to to that intergenerational type of idea there's lots of ideas that work really really well so my passion is to, to, to seek, bring people together to hear the voices of those who perhaps feel that they're not being heard and then translate that into, into action. I was very privileged on behalf of my charity to be awarded an OBE um, at Buckingham Palace in 2012. On behalf of my charity, uh, that has opened up a lot of doors because some people um, uh, like that title and uh, listen to me a bit more because of it uh, around community cohesion. So thank you so much for this opportunity and would love to uh, answer questions if any questions are coming in. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Deborah. That was really engaging. Um, it's lovely how you've tied in personal stories and things that you've experienced in the work that you do into what, what is a very emotive, but equally, um, you know, very intellectual subject. I mean, you know, there's a, there's, there's a link between action planning and theory, and I'm always really keen on the action side, but I'm aware that we need all three strands. So thank you for that. I'm curious, um, I know somebody, somebody has mes messaged me a question, Deborah, so I might ask it now before we officially start our Q and A. Because you were talking about so much pragmatic action and a lot of the people who may watch this are very politically engaged, what can politicians do to help you in your work? And the reason I ask this is, I'm always very hesitant when engaging with a charity because I don't want them to lose their funding. <laughs> and as soon as I'm on the guest list as Vice President of the Liberal Democrats or I'm in a photograph with somebody engaged in the charitable sector, you know, I'm just aware that they then get kickback of, oh, are you supporting one party over another? So how do you tread that line, Deborah? Yeah, well, that is something we have experienced. Um, and um, it is a quite a, a challenge to navigate it, as you say, especially when it comes to things like funding. But we do want to engage with the political parties. And often what we've found is that uh, MPs and members of different political parties, we try to be a little bit equal around, we'll come and speak to the subject rather than their um, political point of view, as it were. It's very difficult to separate the two, as Gordon was saying, really, because there are things that we can see within politics which do need to be reformed. And, and, and I wholeheartedly agree with that, even our language, as Gordon was saying. But I think if we can bring people to the, the subject, if you like, to speak to the subject, um, 
whether that is ageism or whether that is um, what is going on with our young people, uh, uh, you know, troubled families, I don't like that title, but those kinds of issues that are going on within community and, and bring that viewpoint um, and listen to that viewpoint. So we've received endorsements, we've received comments, if you like, and things that then become really useful to open up the door within that community even wider. And I think people appreciate those endorsements and views. Now that's very helpful. Um, you know, I would love to continue the conversation with you because it's not just about ageism in terms of the things, things that I do, but pragmatically taking action is something that I'm so keen to do. And, you know, even if it's from the point of view of um, MPs being able to write letters or ask questions in Parliament about issues, because you must see st systemic issues that need to be addressed that have to, that can only really be done through Parliament. So um, I would love to find out more about that offline perhaps. Um, so I just wanted to flag, we're going to move on to our Q&A session. And what I may do is either address each question to both of you, or I will ask one person and then if the other person wants to chip in, then please feel free to do that. Um, just to flag that Jonathan Fryer will be the first person whose question will come up. So Jonathan, if you could get ready, um, that would be great. And um, Ken, you've said that you don't think you have access to audio or video, but you do have a question. Um, I'm happy to read it, but it's such an intelligent question. I'd really rather you had the glory. <laughs> so if you look on the bottom of your screen, you'll see, and you might need to move your mouse around, but at the bottom of your screen, you'll see something that says mute um, and stop video or start video. And if you press, definitely press the mute button so that you can um, speak, please do that. But if you can click the video button, then we can see you. And don't worry if it all goes terribly wrong, we can fix it. But I'd rather you were live if that's at all possible. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. But Jonathan, would you like to switch on your video and your audio so that you can ask your question, please? I know it's addressed to Gordon, um, but Deborah, do chip in if you have something to add. Um, and while Jonathan is just uh, switching himself on, or our technical team switch Jonathan on, um, it's just, Gordon, just so that you know, it's a question about um, the World Health Organization. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure why the video is not coming on, but I'll uh, give the question orderly. Um, I was pleased, Gordon, that you raised the fact that um, uh, while we in Europe maybe are complacently thinking that the worst is over in the developing world, um, the catastrophe is unfolding and is going to get much worse. And that will make the role of the WHO extremely important. And my question is, to what extent do you think the WHO is addressing age-related issues of COVID-19 at a time when its funding and very existence are under threat from Donald Trump and Jair Bolsonaro? Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Yes, I'll, I'll imagine you, shall I? Um, I mean, the answer first is that the WHO um, is very limited in terms of how it addresses issues around ageing, as is the UN. Um, I've worked over many years with the um, WHO lead on ageing. Um, there's a new one in post. Before that, it was um, John Beard, and before that, it was a Brazilian who now lives in North London. Um, uh, 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 Alex Kalachi. Um, I was a bit taken aback by the discovery that the most support they had in their unit was a part-time secretary. So that having somebody at the WHO who is the only person directly concerned with aging means that um, as the people in that role have done, they've got a sort of bully pulpit and they can express a view. They don't have all that much authority. It's been more useful to work to the WHO via the UN. And um, I, I was reading something this morning by Sasha Sidorenko, who used to run the UN aging program, who's, uh, who's now retired. 
and the, the route through him to influencing the UN um, and the development of the proposed UN Convention on the Rights of Older People has been a more effective way of, uh, of influencing the WHO than their major programs. Um, I mean, the fact is that uh, now on these matters, um, as on as on others, issues around aging have only appeared in t insofar as they are part of the epidemiological record, and that's true for um, quite a range of the other professional bodies which are dealing with it. One of the the problems that arises from that, which we've seen in the UK, um, is that the public health specialists are not people who have normally any background in understanding the demographic and clinical issues around aging so that um, the the people we see at press conferences every day are people whose understanding of issues around aging including clinical issues is very limited because they've been in the business of epidemiological monitoring in the business of developing vaccines and so on which has not helped and enabled a wider public health approach which has been able to take these things into account so i think there is a significant problem it's a long-term one which has always been there it's one we've tried to address um, uh, for instance, through the International Federation on Aging, which Isabel is a, is a body based in Toronto, which has had quite an effect on working with quite a variety of other people, including in the human rights field, which is, I think, one of the reasons for, for the link there. But I think at the fundamental level of understanding aging and the implications of aging and ageism as part of the pandemic, I would not look to either the WHO or its parent body, the UN, for anything coherent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, Deborah, did you want to say anything? You don't have to. Okay. Um, so we do have a question from Ken, and I am hoping that Chris Gleedle, who is the CEO of the Paddy Ashdown Forum, will read it out for me. Um, it's in the chat, Chris. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, Isabel. Yes, this uh, um, uh, question from Ken uh, Bluestone. Um, he, uh, Ken works for Age International, uh, which is an NGO working to help older people in lower and middle income countries and uh, he is also chair of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Older People. The discrimination, denial of access to services and the ageist attitudes towards older people in response to COVID-19 are global. What role can international legal standards such as Human Rights Convention play for articulating more clearly the rights of and reframe attitudes towards older people? Um, I suspect that might be uh, one for uh, Gordon to start with. Yes, uh, thank you. Hello, Ken. Um, it, uh, it's some years since we've met, but um, you're clearly very much in the same field uh, uh, where we used to work together. Um, I think, I, mean, I think the the easy answer, Ken, is is a lot. Um, I've already mentioned the, uh, the proposed UN Convention and that, that's clearly part of it. The work that you and um, Isidora and others are doing on this I think is, is useful and necessary. Um, I think also expanding the understanding of the International um, Convention uh, is important. Within a, a Council of Europe, a wider European context, I think the, the work that, uh, that's being done on uh, the European Convention and issues around ageing and ageism is also quite important. I, I spent a bit of my working life on uh, advising people who are developing um, things like commissions on human rights uh, in different countries and trying to make sure that ageism was built into those. In terms of establishing strong legal standards, I think that international pressure and the sort of institutions that you and others are involved in, the sort of big issues, the big things too, like the, the UN conferences are important. But I think the, the strongest influence on real rights is likely to happen when those are taken up um, 
regionally by bodies with some power of enforcement like the EU um, and, and nationally so that um, conversations in the UK which I've already mentioned about the establishment of our convention but also about how you can develop um, an approach um, on aging that's built into that overall um, uh, that overall package is important. The sort of conversations that we've seen in, uh, say, Brazil or the Philippines or Australia about, or indeed South Africa, about how you can bring those issues into uh, a domestic understanding and how we can use international perspectives to do that seems to me to be possibly the most effective way forward. I should, I should perhaps add, Isabel, since you mentioned um, self-advertisement, that I'm still available for consultancy on these matters. <laughs> You've probably got quite a few clients as a result of this, I suspect, and when it's put on YouTube. Thank you for that, Gordon. Um, Deborah, I, I'd just like to ask you a slightly different angle on that question, um, because the Ken was talking about this whole issue being quite global, and I know you've done a, a, some work internationally, um, can you perhaps talk to us a bit about um, whether you've seen similar trends outside of the UK in terms of the work that you do and the needs that you're seeing? And if you don't yet have enough data on that, um, do you hope to expand that work? Do you think that there could be that need for ROC UK to become ROC International in this sector? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yes, we felt a number of years ago that it would become international. Um, it's a, a tricky area because all cultures are different and you know, for example, that we work a lot with the police. Uh, we work with the fire service, but particularly with the police around the whole idea of reducing crime. And of course, elderly people are often victims of crime. Um, bogus callers at the house, um, people trying to defraud them of their savings, all sorts of issues around that. Um, cult cultures being different in terms of the way communities relate to the police, and this is a huge different subject that I'm bringing up now, which we can see all over the media, social media in, in the United States, for example, and human rights which do affect the, el the older communities as well. Um, so, so the answer is yes, but I think the sensitivities around how, how do you navigate that, and we very much go to where we receive an invitation. So if we received an invitation, for example, from Australia to go and to do some work there, and the culture is in some ways similar, to our culture and certainly the language isn't a barrier in terms of the English language is spoken with a different accent but spoken uh, it, 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 it works it worked really really well but in other places it's a little bit more difficult I do a lot of work in Northern Ireland and we've done a lot people said rock would never launch in Northern Ireland the communities really struggle with the police some shops don't even serve police officers with a bottle of water because there's a hatred there there's a hatred within faith communities as well and the history around that and it's worked really really well in northern ireland for the last 10 years so i think you can overcome barriers but i think we respond to the invitation and we're very open to come with the when we're invited and, and work alongside the local partners who are there to serve their communities in the longer term. We're, we're just a catalyst that helps and empowers along the way. Gosh, and um, I know that I was recently on a panel forum discussion where you had very senior police representation. Um, and so I'm just so impressed with the work that you're able to do with, with bodies and individuals who wouldn't naturally necessarily want to communicate or engage with each other. I, I'm so impressed. So we must actually um, include the details of Rock UK so that if anybody watching did want to make that invitation, they can easily get hold of you. But what's your website very quickly, Deborah? Well, I'll put it on the chat, but it's ROC, for short for Redeem Our Communities, .uk .com. 
Um, we've got a website and we've got We Are Rock on Twitter and another a few other things. I'll just put it into the chat so if, if people want to contact me, thank you. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Could um, I just add a word on that, uh, that, perhaps, Isabel? Because I think the other reference that people might like to, to follow up on this is about age-friendly communities. Um, it, it was an idea that came from Alex Kalachi of the WHO I mentioned before. It, it really has spread quite widely throughout the world. Um, and it came partly from Alex's experience in the very much nowadays aging community where he grew up, which believe it or not is Copacabana. Um, people moved there in the 1930s and are still there. So if you move behind the strip with the beach and the hotels, what you've got is the oldest community in Brazil, including Alex's uh, family. And his idea there was particularly about older people and the police and about ways in which you could help the police to understand issues around aging. And he took that idea and has now applied it. it it's uh, age-friendly communities across Canada, are, uh, really a, a common concept now. We've done a little here so that Manchester, for instance, is an age-friendly city. And um, I don't know how up to date that is, but they did a lot of work on looking not just at the police, but a whole range of other services and at communities and saying, how can we help people to be age friendly, to make this community somewhere where older people feel at home? And that age friendly concept, which is, is still promoted by the WHO, also by the International Federation on Aging, but also by more local and national bodies, really is quite a, a useful and important one that people can relate to. Yeah, just, just to add in that, that's really helpful. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of being, living in a city which is age friendly, is, it's still got a way to go, but a, a police officer friend of mine started an initiative called Chatting Benches. You'll probably be familiar with um, benches out in the community and there's a sign saying this is, if you want to talk to somebody sit on this bench um, and it's been absolutely really successful and that's the kind of idea that you can promote across communities because if a good idea works it's safe you reinventing the wheel let's replicate these good ideas and I think that's one of the things that I can help with if, if there are experts in the field like Gordon and others and Ken and we've just heard from um, have ideas that you feel could be practical that, that could embody some of your thinking I can get those out far and wide because I'm good at rent a crowd so I can get the crowd together and say look look at this idea is this something that you could do um, and there's lots of different ways that we could promote and support and empower people to get involved. Thank you for that. Um, Gordon, you've made me think of Barry Manilow now. So, <laughs> so I, I need to get refocused. Um, but one of the things I was thinking of when you were both talking actually was about the um, dementia friendly initiative that was, that was I, I went to a talk by Angela Rippon, a whole convention in fact, and this was through my role as a foundation governor at a state secondary school. And I wanted to explore how we could help the um, young learners to become more dementia aware. And to be honest, it's something that really does affect this generation of well, my children's age. All of my children, I have four children and they're all of school age. And it is having an impact on them. Um, when they have relatives or friends of the family who are suffering from dementia. And um, one person who I think would be brilliant for you to connect with is somebody called Belinda Lazenby, and I'll put her details in the chat. But she is a former actress who was on Emmerdale. And she now, um, she's, she runs these theatre productions that are so incredibly moving that they're very portable. So she hosts them in, you know, churches, community centres, libraries, schools. Um, and, and they really, they, they educate people on dementia, but it's from the point of view of a young child and how they experience it with grandma. It's, it's so incredibly moving. 
Um, I'll try to look it up and um, send you the details, but she's somebody that I've worked with quite a bit. And um, I just wanted to ask you very quickly about that whole initiative. I don't know where it's got to, but I get the impression it wasn't very widely taken up and that, that disappoints me somewhat. But do you have any knowledge of that or how that sort of issue has been addressed in your communities or the people, places that you work with? Gordon? Um, I think my wife is the person you need for this because she is actually, as well as being deputy leader of the local council, the um, dementia champion and has taken quite a, a strong role in a variety of ways. Um, an example, which um, she's really rather proud of, is that Burnley Football Club was the first um, Premier League football club to become dementia friendly. And the training that's been done uh, with uh, staff at Turf Moor um, has been uh, important and effective. And the things which the local authority has done, working, for instance, with... Uh, uh, business owners, but also with shops, with uh, leisure facilities and so on, have been quite important. There is also uh, uh, I mean, another common initiative, I think, is the Herbert Protocol, which is um, where you put together basic information about a person suffering from dementia, so that if he or she wanders away from home, you immediately have access to the basic information about the sort of places they might go to um, and uh, and their reference points, which just linking the two points was quite useful when Burnley Football Club's most famous uh, footballer um, in his later years um, that did exactly that. So there is a lot happening. It's it's bubbling away, I think, below the radar quite a lot because it's being done at a local authority level. It's being done through bodies like Chambers of Commerce and so on. And uh, I think the Alzheimer's Society has been giving less priority to it in uh, in the last year or so, which I, I, I think is uh, unfortunate because I think there's a lot that can be achieved in, uh, in that sort of way. Um, I think it's also just important that people understand that dementia is not um, an inevitable part of getting older, that the progress of dementia uh, affecting different people happens in different ways. I mean, apart from anything else, of course, it's not always Alzheimer's. There are other forms of dementia which affect people in different ways, that it can take different periods of time and so on. I think the biggest failure probably, and it, it's mirroring the failure in our overall social care system, is the failure to provide effective support for carers, um, for people suffering from dementia. Um, and even at the occasional respite events that, uh, that you can go to and where people can meet each other, um, it is so apparent that people are, are providing on-duty care for 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And occasionally, as, as locally here, um, having a funded place you can go to, um, to talk to others in the same position and get mutual support for two hours a fortnight, hardly addresses the extent of the challenges that those people are facing. I just wanted to add something in if we've got time. One, um, two things. One is um, a number of years ago, I had the privilege to work alongside Sally Magnuson, the broadcaster who co-hosted our launch in Scotland at the Royal Glasgow Concert Hall. And she brought our attention to an initiative called Where Memories Go. Some of you may have read that book and seen some of the work that has been done around stimulating memory by the playing of familiar music to the, per, to the in that person's childhood or early adulthood that has then brought back memories or those emotions associated with that those particular pieces of music and it's just a brilliant piece of work which i wanted to signpost um, she is on Twitter and uh, she has written uh, quite extensively on, on it. Lovely lady, uh, based on the experience of losing her own mum. And then the other thing was that some work that we did um, a few years ago, um, it kind of picks up on what Gordon's just been saying, that there are definitely gaps in provision 
huge gaps in provision and um, this pandemic has shown us that uh, but we did a, a piece of work a few years ago where um, it was really highlighted that a Saturday is quite a challenging day of the week because often services are provided Monday through Friday and then all of a sudden completely disappears at the weekend. And so we started to target Saturday in terms of providing additional support on top of what maybe social services were providing um, and, and it worked really well. I think it was in the Haywards Heath area of, um, of Sussex around that whole kind of area that we worked with again in partnership to try and look at where are the gaps at times of the week, where are the gaps in terms of provisions and what can the voluntary sector do which is what my my piece is bringing in that, working alongside others to help with. So that those are just two things I wanted to mention. Wow, thank you very much, Deborah. Um, we will bring things to a close, but please stay on, because I'm just gonna give Deborah and Gordon a couple of minutes to think about what they would want us to take away from this. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to say thank you to them for preparing so, so in such detail and really making this subject come alive in a way that perhaps some of us wouldn't necessarily have been aware of. So thank you so much for the, not only the time that you've spent, but also being very informative and engaging. And to all of those people who are watching, who have joined us, thank you for taking the time at lunchtime during the weekday. I know that for many people working during the lockdown has become actually much harder, especially with um, children and people to care for at home. So thank you for spending the time. And I'm also very grateful to those who will be watching on YouTube or at some point in the future via the Paddy Ashdown Forum website. Um, please do keep an eye out for the next session that we're running. And it's on the geopolitics of COVID-19. And that's in conjunction with the Liberal Democrats overseas. And that will be on a Sunday. It's on the 28th of June and it's at two o'clock. And we have two brilliant speakers, Paul Reynolds, who just knows everything about everything. That's the way I'd describe Paul. And Dr. Christine Cheng, who is a wonderful friend of mine and a very learned uh, professor from King's College London. So please do look out for that. And um, I'm hoping that Chris will put the details of the Paddy Ashdown Forum into the chat. I've also put the details of Belinda Lazenby. Um, the play that she runs is called Grandma Remember Me. And it is so incredible. I have watched it three times. Um, and I don't, I don't want to ruin any of the surprises in it, but please do um, book to see it. I think that access to that is free because it's running community centres. But after this call, I, if it's okay with you, Gordon and Deborah, I'll link you all together um, because I think that Belinda would be such a fantastic connection for you both. Um, so that's all from me. I'd like to thank the back office team, Lauren and Chris, who have been hiding away, don't want to be seen on screen, but they're the people who actually make this all work. They do so much groundwork in the background. Um, it's quite unbelievable. Uh, so thank you to both of them. But I would like to give the floor now to Gordon and Deborah just to give us a takeaway. So Gordon, would you like to speak first? Uh, yes, thank you, Isabel. Thank you for the opportunity to do this. Um, and, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, pick up some more recent information that I've had access to from Ken Bluestone on uh, some of these global matters that will just teach me to uh, about pontificating on these matters when, uh, when I'm out of date. The first takeaway I, I would want to leave people with is ageism exists. Ageism exists and it's an important part of our society. Uh, in the UK it is actually the most commonly reported form of discrimination in a variety of ways, although it's improved very much um, in, in areas like employment for instance uh, over the years. But it is founded in attitudes, beliefs, about aging and older people and those are the those are the things we most need to address um i just wanted to add a word really to uh, to encroach on on deborah's area I'm, I'm sure she'll agree with me but i i've come to put a lot of emphasis 
on the way we help with and manage bereavement. Um, I worked quite a lot with um, people around issues of bereavement and, and indeed end of life. Um, conventional views of bereavement, I think, um, from the work of a man called Colin Murray Parks many years ago, are pretty inadequate, not least because the issues of bereavement he studied around Air Force widows in their 30s are not actually the same as the issues around bereavement which people in their 70s or 80s will feel after the death of somebody that they have lived with for 50 or 60 years. How you intervene, perhaps not the right word, but the right concept, how you involve yourself with people at the time for bereavement, how you help them through that, is crucial, I think, in terms of how they relate later. And it's particularly important with men who are simply not as good as women about the relationships that you need to replace the loss of someone after, after bereavement. And how we develop the ideas about providing support, how we learn how to do that, I think is, is very important in itself. I mean, one of the, the phrases I learned, which I, I've found very helpful since, is that when somebody is faced with any major change in their life, there are people who respond to this by taking a step forward and touching them. And there are people who respond to that change by stepping back and thinking, I don't know what to do. Mm. Actually, if you have suffered a major loss, you need more people who are engaging with you, who are taking a step forward, who are actually saying, let me listen to you, let me hear what it is you're saying and so on. And I, I think some of the issues around bereavement and about how you construct a new set of social links um, after bereavement are very important indeed in terms of how we address um, some of the issues about loneliness. Um, Gordon, for that and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to cut you off because I'm, I'm trying to be respectful of people's time but can you type the last point into your ch into the chat mm -hmm. because I know people will want to know what it was and um, Deborah do you want to uh, give us a takeaway yeah just a short thing um, go, as Gordon mentioned Burnley earlier on and in Burnley we are actually just currently pioneering um, a piece of work with a charity called at a loss I put it into that. the chat and mm. it's going to address um, not adults at the moment who have lost yeah. a loved one, but young yeah. people working in partnership with Burnley Football Club where we had our rock conversation event. So at a loss is a, is a good charity for you to look up. Mm. Um, just so just my takeaway would be um, around highlighting the issue for more people. When we do our events, the biggest thing people say to me is, we heard loads of good ideas, but we didn't know about it. We, there wasn't any kind of joined up way of linking all these initiatives together to avoid duplication, as I said before. So it's about raising awareness with more people so that the, these issues can be raised and the ignorance starts to drop away and we um we can we can hear one another and learn to respect one another and work well together thank you so much uh, deborah and gordon um, and i'm sure that if there are any follow-up questions or comments that chris gleedle will gather them together and perhaps add them into the bottom of the the youtube um, sort of video there's a space for comments and a sort of summary but i really appreciate your time everyone and um you know just ending on the point that Deborah has raised, I am definitely a person who loves discussion and raising awareness, absolutely, um, but action has got to be the outcome. So I'm hoping that as a follow-up to this, we will be able to actually take some steps to make change. So thank you very much, everyone. And um, hopefully I will see you again at some point in the work that we do. Take care.